Welcome to For Fact's Sake. I'm Brad and this is part two of answering the question, how do you edit a Fact Fiend video? So if you haven't already seen the first part, then I would recommend going and checking that one out first. But if you haven't seen that episode, I'll just quickly sum up where we are so far. So we have brought our raw footage and audio into Premiere, we've cut it up, and then we've trimmed that down into what will be the final episode. So the next stage of the process is to fact check the episode. The majority of the facts that Carl talks about are directly from the articles which he has already researched. So oftentimes there isn't a huge amount of stuff to verify. Even so, it's important to us that we make sure that the videos we're putting out are 100% factually accurate, which is why when me or Nisha or Lucas will fact check a video, we fact check everything that Carl says. If we find something that does happen to be incorrect, we will either edit that out depending on how important it is to the video. Uh, if it is integral to the video, then we'll often put in the fact bars at the bottom just to explain the reason why it's incorrect and to tell people what the, the truth of it is. So how do we go about fact checking? Well, I imagine that the other editors have their own ways of doing it, but the way that I choose to do it is to play through the video and make quick notes on everything that Carl says that could be proven wrong. So when the opinions are left alone, it's always just when he states something which could be proven to be factually accurate or inaccurate. So my way of doing this involves the video description. Everybody who's watched the video knows that we have a description which, for the most part, is the same in every single video. I think there are minor variations between the versions that Nisha and Lucas use and the version I use. But what you see in front of you now is a blank description template, which is what I use whenever I do a new video. So this template is just missing the information and it also has the information of every single person who is currently contributing to the channel, either in front of or behind the camera. So this video that I'm currently working on features Carl and Lucas, which means I can delete Nisha and Lulu and just leave Feature and Lucas edited by Brad. Because this is a Fact Fiend video and not a wiki video, I can also get rid of the Samba Isabel, which is the track that is used in the wiki videos. So there's nothing left now but to go through and start making notes of things that I need to fact check. Okay, so I've been through and I've now made my notes for things I need to fact check. Now, as you can see on the screen, they're not the most coherent things, they don't need to be. They just need to be enough to remind me of what I'm looking for. So the best way to fact check any of the Fact Fiend videos is to start on the Fact Fiend website because the article that Carl originally wrote, which is what he's using as prompts for the video, usually has the sources that he used for this information. So what we do is we'll scroll down this article and we'll find anywhere that he's linked something. Then we read the article that Carl has linked to try and double check some of the information in the video. That's basically it for the fact checking. We'll just go through articles and we'll just verify everything that's been said. So there we go, all the facts have now been verified. I only found one mistake, which is that Carl got the name of Dominic Purcell's character wrong. It's not Fireborg, it's Heatwave. So not too big a deal, just put it in the back at the bottom, put a little asterisk on so people know it's a correction, and I imagine it'll be forgiven. So the next stage of the process is twofold. We gather the images that are going to be going in the background, and then we gather the clips that are going to be going throughout the video. Again, I find the easiest way to do this is just play through the video and just listen carefully, and whenever I hear a place where I would put an image in, I put I write down the image, and whenever I find a place I'll put a clip in, I write down the clip. If anyone's wondering what the logic is to what images go in, uh, the way that I normally do it, because we all do these videos slightly differently, I will put an image in if the subject of the image is going to be a big topic of discussion, either throughout the video or in the next segment that Carl is talking about. So if, for example, he says, it's like in this film, then mentions the film, and then talks about that film, I will put an image of that film. But if he just says, that reminds me of the bit in this film where this happens, I won't put the picture in, I'll just put the clip in. With a standard fact video, I try to aim for six or more pictures, because it just fills the background better. This is also the part of the process where we bring two-finger Johnny, because I use that to mark where clips are going to go. Because YouTube's copyright system is very arsehole a lot of the time. I will always favour an image and I will only ever put a clip in if Carl specifically says, here is a clip of this. There are exceptions where we'll just put something because it's cool, but for the most part, we don't want to run the risk of having the entire video demonetized because we decide to put in an eight second clip of something that doesn't need to be there. OK, 
Okay, I have my list of clips and images that I now need to source. So obviously, as you may have gathered, the next part of the process is to source the images and clips. So when it comes to images, uh, we will tend to use images from things like Wikipedia, Wikipedia Commons, because those images, even if they're not in the public domain, uh, they will be licensed under the Creative Commons attribution, which means that we're allowed to use the image as long as we provide the um, a link to the original source. A lot of the time I'll use websites like Pixabay to get uh, public domain images. So for example, for this one, when I have to look for an image for sound design, I'll start in a place like that because then I don't need to attribute the image to anyone because they've been released into the public domain and anybody can use them for commercial or for personal purposes. We also use a lot of images like movie posters and promotional art and things like that, which uh, I, I mean, technically they will be under some kind of copyright, but those images have been released into the world to promote those things. So in my mind, it would be stupid for a company to look at that and say, we don't want you using our image because surely they would want you to use the best quality version of the image that's out there to better promote their stuff. It's much like Let's Plays. It's sort of one of those unspoken things that hasn't really been clarified, but that everybody is just sort of on board with. When it comes to getting clips, there's a variety of different ways to do this. The easiest is probably just YouTube because the majority of important major scenes from movies and TV shows are uploaded in high definition to YouTube for you to access. Uh, there's various streaming services you can also access the images and clips on. And if in doubt, you can also purchase like DVDs or digital copies in order to get particular scenes that you need. This is often a long and tedious process, so I'm just going to gather all these things now and we'll be back with them af after this. <laughs> You can tell I've been recording for a while today, can't you? Oh, I'm so tired. So after the long, tedious hunt, I finally have all the images I need to use and the clips I need to use. Before the images can be brought into Premiere, I just need to go through them all and make sure that they're all of decent quality and they're not too big. Because a lot of these images have a very large file size, like a large resolution. Programs like Premiere and After Effects will run slower if the image is massive and it's been scaled down. So it's easier just to do that beforehand. So you may have noticed throughout this demonstration of the way that we edit videos, we have a lot of templates already set up in order to make the process a lot faster. Uh, this is another one of those. This one is for video titles and for slides. So we have no facts in this video, but we do need to add a minor correction because Carl, as I said, uh, Carl had the name of the uh, Dominic Purcell's character incorrect. So that will just go over the top of that just to let people know that we are aware. It's mostly to cover us so the people in the comments aren't just going, oh my god, you got this wrong. because. It happens every single time. People don't even read this. I guarantee when this video goes live, there will be at least one comment of someone saying that we got the character name wrong. You'll see as well that I've also filled in the other sections of the description in the, the downtime while I was looking for clips and videos and stuff. Clips and videos, images and clips. Right, so we've brought all of our images and clips into the project, as you can see. I have a very specific name and convention for my stuff just because I find it easier if you start them off with the same like few letters then when they're ordered by name everything appears in the right order. So now we've just got to piece all of it together, put everything into its place. So all of the images and clips for the first section, the fact section, have been put in. What I'm going to do is move on to the next part. Uh, probably one of the most difficult parts, I would say, or at least it was to begin with. We're so used to it now, it's it's easy. Like Once again, we have presets and stuff ready, but the, the act of putting the images and everything in the background. Now, the challenge here is often based on, first of all, how the camera has been set up, because, believe it or not, there have been some times when the green screen hasn't been in the middle or the camera's been too far away or too close. There have also been times when Carl isn't sitting in the center. Uh, the lighting can also affect it. Sometimes the uh, with that he's got the blinds and stuff open in the office and it's a lot brighter. And uh, if the sun goes in and out and it changes, it affects the key. Thankfully, the motto of professionally unprofessional kind of protects us whenever the keying or the green screen or the lighting or anything don't look quite right. This part of the process takes place in After Effects. Now, if anybody doesn't know what After Effects is, I know a lot of people are familiar with Premiere for editing and for Photoshop for image manipulation. After Effects is basically Photoshop for videos. So it allows you to 
cut up, move, edit, manipulate videos in the same way that you can with images in Photoshop. So all we do here is select what we want to bring into After Effects, which is the images and the background footage. Right click and replace with After Effects composition. There we go. So you can see all of the images are in, all of the clips are in. First thing we do, select all the clips, pre-compose, just so that they all exist in a single file. So there's a little trick here that I've learned, and I don't know if Nisha and Lucas know this. If you select the bottom layer in a stack and then select the top one, Control C, copy them, delete them and then paste them back in. It will paste them in in reverse order. Uh, we need them this way for the video, so it just saves us a whole bunch of time. I used to rearrange them by hand and it took a long time. So you'll see the images are in and they're all in the correct places. I just want to say as well, there may be better ways of doing all of this. I trained myself to use these bits of software like 10 years ago and only recently have I been trying to update my knowledge. So anyone in the comments, if you are an editor, or if you've used these bits of software before and you know a faster way of doing certain things, let us know and we'll give it a try because you may be able to save us a ton of time. So for a fat free video, to create the look that we go for, what we need here is three layers of Carl. In our assets folder, we have a background text file. Obviously you can't see it at the moment because it's on the layer beneath, but if I turn these two layers off, you can see the background text fills up the entire screen. This is obviously cropped off whenever the, when the key is put. So there's nothing left now but to put a quick key on. So I did have a bunch of presets for this, but because the green screen and the lighting changes so much, a lot of them are quite difficult to use. So I tend to just do the key from the start now. It doesn't take too much time to do a quick, uh, a quick key. So if Carl was wearing a green shirt or had a uh, like a green thing on the desk, like that little gorilla that he likes to put on the desk or the little dinosaur, that would start to disappear because you can see as you bring this level up, we're starting to lose detail in places like this. I don't know why I'm pointing the screen, you can't see my hand. This down here, if we uh, turn the layer off, you can see that there's bits of green and bits of yellow on this Final Fantasy case. They're the first things to go. But obviously, we're not going to crank it up that high because we're getting a fairly decent key anyway. As I said, this is a very quick key. We have a, I have a very specific set of simple presets that I put in. And what you get is just a very basic key around Carl. His hair is always a little bit messed up, but keying hair out is something that takes a lot of time and effort if you want to do it properly. And it's a YouTube video and it's meant to look a bit naff. There, so we copy this one and paste it onto there. And as you can see, the text layer is now in the background. So these layers here are now locked. I don't need to do anything else to them. What I need to do on the front layer though, is use a mask to remove the edges. If I'm getting a bit quieter, by the way, I apologize. It's getting quite late. Okay, when it comes to putting the background images in, uh, what I try to aim for is like a circle. Uh, yeah, and there we go. That would be the image layout for this video. As you can see, I've created a loose circle or oval, I guess if you want to be uh, pedantic about it. So once the images are in, the next step is to have them animate. So I do have a preset for this. What this preset does is it applies a transform modifier. It also adds a drop shadow, so I don't need to do that myself either. Something else I do to speed this process up, and if you're an editor, I would highly recommend doing this, is that my mouse, uh, I've got a gaming mouse, I have a thumb button here, is key bound to one of the buttons that I use in this a lot, and using the key binds to give yourself like an edge on things, like on my Premiere, I think this is delete. So I don't need to move my hand over to the other side of the keyboard to delete things. So if you're using this kind of software on the regular, I would highly recommend binding the things you use all the time to either your mouse or to other buttons that are near where your hand is going to be resting. Big, big pro tip from Brad. And then we simply drag this preset on. Use the transform position now to move this out of the frame. And then, as you can see, when the motion blur is turned on, five frames, whizzes in, and stops where it's supposed to. That's it. That's how we bring the images in. When we first started making videos, I really regretted making this part of the video editing process because it takes so it used to take so long to do. And it wasn't until I realized that I could set up presets for things, I realized that I could speed up the process a huge amount. 
Okay, that's it. All the images are now animated. Let's select all the ones that I didn't put the motion blur on and turn the motion blur on. Now, as you can see, any layer we click on now will be whizzing in at the start of the frame. So I could technically export it now and this section at least, obviously I'm doing the end section, we'll do that in a sec, but this section at least would be done. But I always like to go through and fully preview everything before we export it. And in order to do that without it lagging, we have to export this After Effects part so that we can bring that in as a um, like a single file, like a flattened, merged, I don't know what you call it, pre-composed. Once they've exported, I can bring them back in and then we can just play through without this happening. Subject matter they contain. And in a flash comic book, you can have just like the word. So this is why we export it. Because otherwise, you can't watch it back. Maybe with a beefier computer. Maybe if you sign up to our Patreon and we get more money, I can get a supercomputer that can do it. There we go. Obligatory Patreon plug. Anyway, I'm going to leave this exporting and I guess I'll be back once it's done. The following day. It is the following day. And as you can see, everything is pieced together and almost ready to export. There's one more step that I like to go through, and it's basically just double checking. Now, this is what I usually call my sound pass, because what I do here is I go through and I listen to the audio and I make sure that there's no abrupt cuts. I add in crossfades between where the clips come in and the clips go out, just so that it's a bit easier on the ears, especially for people like me who are wearing expensive headphones. So let's do that final pass now, and then the video is ready to export. I think that's it. I think we're done. So all in all, the amount of time it takes to edit these videos varies depending on the complexity of the video. So this one in particular had a fair amount of images and a fair amount of clips. And those things to obviously add time to source. I would say altogether, this video has taken me between six to eight hours to edit. That may seem like a long time, but videos used to take me between 16 to 20 hours when the channel first started. We've discovered all of these shortcuts. We've got all these templates. The fact that I also edit on a faster speed massively decreases the amount of time it takes to do one of these videos. So all that will be left now is to export it and upload it to YouTube. We have the description that we've already finished. Uh, we get a thumbnail done as well. Anyway, I've talked for a long time. That is the gist of it. That is how you edit a fact for your video. I don't know if Nisha and Lucas have any variations. I know Lucas told me he uses markers a lot. Uh, for anyone unfamiliar with Premiere, if you press M, it adds a marker here. And you can basically use that to designate locations. I think he uses it for like to designate where he's going to put images. It just doesn't work with my current workflow, but it's something that I should, probably should use in future because markers are very useful for finding your place in a composition. So if you have any other burning questions about the way the channel's put together, if you have any questions about the editing process I've just shown you, then leave them in the comments below. So thank you for joining me for this episode of For Fact's Sake. Uh, I'll be very happy if you went and checked out some of the other videos on the channel from all of us. We, again, put a lot of work into those videos as well, and it's always a shame when particular videos don't get a lot of traction when you put a lot of time in. So if you've enjoyed this video, go watch the rest of them and obviously comment below. Say, Brad sent me from the FAQ video. Woo! <laughs> if you want to support the channel, we have a Patreon active that is primarily to support this channel so that we don't have to run ads. So if you want to be supportive of this, um, of what we're doing, you can find the link to the Patreon below as well. Right, time to get this uploaded.